Okay, then we can start. I would like to welcome you all to this uh, Europe seminar. Uh, the title is What Global Role for the EU After Brexit? Uh, my name is Pani Lerikid. I'm a research professor here at NUPI, uh, heading the Cent NUPI Center for European Studies. And I will also inform you before we start that this um, seminar will be streamed. Okay, so just a few words to, for introduction first. Um, when the UK eventually leaves the EU, the EU's role as an actor in the world will change. But the question is how and in what way? Um, on the one hand, the EU loses an important military power and a key player in international politics. And this may potentially weaken uh, the Union's role uh, at the global stage. But on the other hand, Britain Brexit may also force the remaining member states to pull its acts together as a consequence of Brexit, Brexit and also the new geopolitical context, and thereby strengthen its role. And history of European integration has also shown that the EU is often moving forward in a time of crisis. But then we also may see a different development towards a more what has been referred to as horizontal differentiation in integration, meaning that there will be different constellations, some coordination happening among, among members only, but also an increase in coordi increasing coordination between the EU and closely associated third countries that basically share many of the same values and interests as the EU as such. And here in this group, of course, we have Norway, uh, but maybe also soon the UK. And France has already taken some initiatives in this direction in the area of defence with the European Intervention Initiative, where both Norway and the UK is participating. And we may also see more of this in other areas. In a period where the world is faced with the global a global power shift, the weakening of the transatlantic cooperation and forces that aim at undermining the existing multilateral institutions, there might be more support for building a stronger union that can better defend its common interest and shared values in a new context. Within such a framework, we might also see constellation of cooperation between the EU and the UK in areas such as trade and development, transatlantic relations and security and defence. But this will also depend on how the post-Brexit British foreign policy will develop and perhaps also how the transatlantic relations will develop and how the UK will position itself in this relationship once outside the EU. So to give us some insight about this topic, we are very fortunate to have Professor Mike Smith here from the University of Warwick. Uh, Mike will present his work on the interplay between Brexit and the EU's international role. He will focus on the UK case discourse about global Britain and EU's global strategy from 2016. And by looking at these globalist discourses, Professor Smith will discuss how EU external action will be shaped by Brexit in three dif different areas, namely trade and development, transatlantic re relations and security and defence policy. Mike is also part of um, Research Council funded project Transat, which is led by Professor Marianne Ridwell uh, at Inland University and NUPI. And several NUPI researchers, including myself, participate in this project. Mike Smith is honorary uh, professor in European politics at the University of Warwick and also emeritus professor at European politics at Logborough University. And he has also published extensively on EU external policies and on EU diplomacy. And we very much look forward to your presentation. So with not further ado, I will give you the floor. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Pernilla. Um, uh, that was a very wide-ranging introduction. I hope I can live up to the, uh, the agenda that uh, Pernilla was setting. Um, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be back at uh, NUPI. Uh, it was a long time ago that I was here before, and it wasn't here, so to speak. It was uh, elsewhere in Oslo. Um, uh, uh, I'm planning to, uh, uh, to talk for about 35 or 40 minutes, um, and uh, then obviously uh, we can have a, a discussion. And uh, I, uh, I anticipate that uh, in discussion, uh, there will be a lot of questions I can't possibly answer because nobody can answer them about Brexit and that kind of thing. But we can talk about them and uh, uh, we can think about the, uh, the way in which uh, things might go. Uh, uh, inevitably, of course, with the Brexit process, the, the timing of this talk is either extremely good or extremely bad. Um, because uh, uh, as for the last uh, 
mm, it seems like forever now, uh, we can't really tell what's even going to happen tomorrow, let alone uh, uh, what's going to happen in uh, five years' time. Um, my argument is not really so time-dependent, though, because it's about the ways in which uh, the European Union, and I am going to be talking about the European Union, but inevitably I'll talk about British uh, foreign policy as well. Um, it's, it's an argument about the forces confronting the European Union's external role, uh, many of which are independent of uh, Brexit. Uh, it's uh, one of the features of Brexit, of course, that the British think the world revolves around them, uh, and actually, of course, it doesn't. Uh, and uh, the problem, uh, the gap between the perception that Britain is at the centre of the world and the reality is uh, one of the big issues uh, in Brexit itself. Um, uh, uh, we can also talk about the importance of uh, what I'm going to say or the possibilities I'm going to raise uh, for Norway, and I'm happy to do that, although you're the experts on that rather than, uh, rather than me, but we can, we can talk about that uh, uh, set of issues. Um, okay, what I'm going to talk about, uh, these uh, things. Um, first of all, and I'd better get my watch out because I... Oh, there's a clock there, right, good. <laughs> um, uh, 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 first of all, I'm going to talk about, uh, as Penilla said, about the, uh, the discourses of globalism uh, in both British and EU foreign policy, because, of course, these uh, discourses of globalism intersect, uh, and they uh, condition each other, and they are uh, partly dependent upon each other. Uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, the way in which you can translate these discourses into uh, action and into policy, uh, and particularly through the idea of uh, roles, the idea that uh, uh, you can analyse the roles that are conceived by, uh, in this case, the EU, but also Britain, uh, and use that as a guide to the extent to which they can perform those roles. Uh, because uh, it's no good having a, a grandiose role conception uh, and not being able to implement it or act in accordance with it. And uh, that gap, again, is something that uh, uh, I want to talk about. Uh, then I'm going to say something about the three areas that Pernilla mentioned, uh, trade and development, uh, transatlantic relations, and security and defense. Um, these aren't the only uh, uh, areas in which we could uh, talk about uh, the relationship between EU uh, external action and uh, Brexit, um, but they're three of the most consequential and they may also, of course, be three of the most consequential for a uh, third country, so to speak, like, like Norway. Uh, and in those areas, I'm going to talk about the ways in which uh, uh, the uh, uh, changing global forces uh, can actually influence not only British policy and its uh, potential, uh, but also, of course, European policy. And then I'll, then I'll draw some conclusions in terms of the, uh, uh, the, the points I make at the beginning about uh, uh, roles and about the ability to perform those roles. Um, okay, first of all, a, a, a tiny bit of history because you can't understand uh, some of this without understanding uh, some history. Um, uh, one of the uh, images which uh, some people say is has most conditioned ideas of British foreign policy over a very long period uh, is the idea of the so-called three circles of British influence and British engagement in the world arena. Um, and this was an idea that was first really put out by Winston Churchill, which of course makes it very relevant to the Conservative Party and their images of uh, uh, Britain's international role. And the idea uh, without drawing it for you, is clearly that uh, uh, the British, and uh, to some extent only the British in this conception, uh, can occupy a point at which the three intersecting areas of policy, uh, the transatlantic relationship, Europe, and uh, in British terms, the Commonwealth, uh, the residuals of, of empire, uh, intersect. Uh, and 
of course, there are two ways of looking at that. Uh, one is that this gives the British unparalleled leverage and engagement on a global scale. Uh, the other is that it puts them at the centre of a whole bunch of forces that they can't actually control. Uh, and that being at the centre of this set of uh, forces is more of a prison uh, than it is of uh, a source of opportunities. And we'll come back to that uh, in, in just a second. Uh, the point I want to make here is that there's uh, a similar kind of issue at the centre of European foreign policy, talking collectively about uh, 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 European foreign policy and particularly about the foreign policies of some of the larger European countries, uh, that all of them have in some ways uh, a problem of uh, engagement with a set of intersecting policy uh, forces and policy requirements. Um, uh, most obviously, I guess, in the sense of the French, who have almost the same issue as the British. Uh, they have not just, some people would say, the residue of an empire, uh, but also but an area of engagement which very much reflects an imperial uh, past. Uh, they have, of course, the engagement in Europe, uh, more so than, than the British in, in some ways. Um, and they have the transatlantic uh, circle, uh, which may or may not be more congenial to them than the transatlantic circle is to the British. And we'll come back to Donald Trump uh, later on. Um, uh, so for, for European countries, and I'm not just talking about France, but for a number of European countries, uh, there is this intersection of transatlantic, post-imperial, uh, or third world engagement and uh, the European commitment. Um, so uh, each of these countries, and it, it goes from the smallest to the largest in many ways, uh, is uh, confronted with this set of intersecting and not always complementary forces uh, that uh, affect their policies. Um, the second thing that many of them uh, are subject to uh, in different ways, is a discourse of retreat uh, uh, that in many ways since 1945 the policies of large numbers of European countries have become more concentrated on Europe and there's been a retreat from a sort of globalist, imperialist uh, uh, perspective. Um, uh, this was most obvious in the case of the UK uh, through what was called at the time the collapse of options. In other words, this, is, this tells you something about the British discourse about Europe, of course, the way in which engagement with the European integration project was seen as a sign of defeat. It was seen that as, a, as a sign that you, you were no longer capable of operating as the power you had been. But again, in many ways, this has been the case for a number of European countries, that the European integration project has in a way paradoxically at one and the same time been seen as a way of recovering global influence but also as a way of uh, formalizing a kind of retreat from uh, an independent national global policy. So the, the, this set of forces that operate on uh, most if not all of European foreign policies uh, in terms of the ways in which they engage with these major uh, circles of influence or of uh, uh, problems that have to be addressed. Um, not surprisingly, uh, even after uh, full commitment to the European project, which of course was never entirely full in the case of the British, um, uh, you have uh, globalist discourses that persist. And in many ways, as I just mentioned, the European Union becomes a way of recovering some kind of global uh, influence and global uh, uh, leverage, um, which you may say makes it rather odd that the British uh, would like to disengage themselves from this particular source of global influence. Uh, and we'll come back in more detail to that in a second. Um, over the past few years, uh, there have been a number of efforts to, in both Britain and in the European Union, uh, to, uh, to f address, confront, uh, and deal with uh, this particular set of issues. Um, one of them is obviously Brexit. Uh, and the idea that through Brexit, uh, the British can recover their global influence and can recover their status as a major uh, 
uh, part of the international arena. And to give you a flavor of this, and probably betrays my political persuasion as well, I'm afraid, um, last week's New Statesman uh, had on the front of it uh, the fantasy of global Britain. Uh, the idea that, uh, and, and global Britain, of course, has been one of the areas of discourse that has emerged from Brexit. The idea that you can rebrand Britain, not as cool Britannia like uh, Tony Blair did or tried to, uh, but as global Britain, and that uh, uh, once we are freed from the shackles of the European Union, we will be able to bound onto the global stage and be a leader in multilateralism, a leader in... Uh, uh, trade, a leader of various areas, uh, and that we've been uh, sort of held back from this by uh, membership of the European Union. And the argument in the article in the New Statesman is essentially that uh, the idea of global Britain, as opposed to imperial Britain, uh, is uh, a complete delusion. Uh, that it's, it seems to indicate that there's some sort of buccaneering Britain, uh, which if just released from these ties would resume a role that it had had before. But that's inseparable, well the role of global Britain in the 19th and 18th centuries is inseparable from empire. So how you can do it without uh, attempting and failing to recreate some sort of empire is uh, 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 a, an interesting question. Um, on the European front, uh, uh, there has, of course, been uh, the European Union Global Strategy, and this is the most recent manifestation of it. Uh, the report on the third year or the three years of the Global Strategy so far. Um, uh, three years on and looking forward, as it says. Uh, significantly, and I haven't, I must claim. Not, I must disclaim the idea that uh, I have read every word of this document, which has only been extant for a few weeks. Um, there's one mention that I can see of Brexit, right? And that's in the beginning where it talks about the publication of the global strategy initially, which was you know, the weekend or the week beginning after the referendum on British uh, uh, exit from the European Union. As far as I'm aware, there is almost there's certainly almost no other mention of Brexit, and uh, uh, that is interesting uh, because it chimes in with the argument I want to make, uh, uh, which is essentially at the end of the day uh, that the forces that condition the European ro Union's role in the global arena uh, have rather little to do with Brexit. Uh, it may, that may affect uh, particular expressions of that role and that form, uh, but it's much uh, subordinate to a, a range of global forces that uh, uh, will become apparent as I go on. Um, so the question is, well, yeah, okay, you can say people have talked about there is a discourse in both Britain and in the European Union, and they've become separate discourses about globalism. On the one side, the idea that you can recover some sort of lost global uh, influence through leaving the European Union. On the other hand, uh, that in a sense it's only by belonging to the European Union that its member states can achieve global influence through a global strategy uh, and can achieve uh, what the European Union has called uh, strategic autonomy uh, in the international arena. So getting from there to actually, you know, policy and what happens in particular areas, uh, I see as being helped uh, through the idea of role. In other words, that by looking at these ideas of globalism, uh, you can develop an idea of how Britain and the European Union, European Union at the European level, not all of the member states individually, uh, have developed a notion of their global role. And we've just referred to that in a sense. Um, and how you get from the role to the impact on policy and the ways in which policy is designed and, and pursued uh, is something I want to talk about in the rest of this uh, address. Um, This is just a very, very simple framework uh, for considering the roles of the European Union and incidentally the role of the United Kingdom as well. Um, one of the things that's fairly obvious is that during the uh, membership of the UK, and I'm not 
I'm not really talking in the past tense uh, because uh, there is still a hope that it might not be in the past tense and we can discuss that one later on as well. Um, uh, but during the membership of the UK so far, uh, there have been problems of role. A problem of role for the UK, whether it's going to subordinate itself to the European Union, as, it, as British policymakers might have seen it, or whether it's to be a leader within the European Union. Uh, and uh, the question is uh, whether that's made the British, uh, as a guy called Stephen George once called them, an awkward partner. Um, there's no doubt about it, the British have been an awkward partner within the European Union. They've been an awkward partner for some people outside the European Union as well. And, and the question is uh, the extent to which within the European Union the British were able to actually pursue uh, their role as a particular kind of foreign policy actor, a particular kind of foreign policy influence. Uh, and opinions differ about that, and we could go on for the rest of my 35 minutes or 40 minutes uh, uh, talking about that. But the other part of the equation is that the EU has always had a problem and still has a problem about what its international role is going to be, um, about how the European Union can translate uh, very, very broad statements about what it talking about the European Union, would like to be in the international arena into specific policy initiatives and the way in which those policy initiatives might work. And that was the purpose, of course, of the global strategy. Um, previous uh, incarnations of European Union strategy uh, in the early 21st century were very general and very uh, aspirational about the way in which the European Union should operate. The thing about this, and the thing about this report on the European Union, is it goes uh, into very great detail about exactly what they've done, what they've achieved, uh, and the ways in which that has related to the initial setting out of the global strategy uh, in 2016. Um, so it's intended to be an operational document as well as some sort of aspirational document. Um, but it doesn't necessarily resolve the problem that the EU has had, uh, which is that uh, there's always a gap between what the collective uh, of the European Union can aspire to, uh, the idea that the European Union should be a different kind of power in the international arena, uh, the idea that it expresses a particular kind of normative position, that the idea of the European Union in itself is a force for good in the international arena, which of course was reinforced when the European Union a few uh, years back was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, the idea that the European Union is some, uh, a unique peace project and that part of its task is to project that project onto the rest of the world. Now that can be seen as a good or a bad thing, uh, but that's certainly something that's characterised the European Union uh, declaration of its role. The question is whether the European Union is actually able to pursue that role, uh, whether it's able to uh, uh, put into operation policies that uh, lead it towards that particular kind of aspiration. And uh, last, last Friday I was, uh, did some training for the European External Action Service in Brussels uh, about the subject of multilateralism, the idea that the European Union is uniquely committed to the multilateral system, uh, all of those international agencies from the United Nations downwards or sideways uh, that help with global governance. And one of, the, one of the things that emerged very clearly from that, and this was European External Action Service uh, officials that we were talking to, is that uh, the gap between the aspiration of being uh, a force for multilateralism in the international arena comes flat up against, first of all, the fact that this may not actually correspond with European interests in any particular case. And secondly, at a different level, that it may not correspond with the ways in which European Union member states uh, conceive of their interests and their roles in the international arena. So there's a problem. Uh, it's not so much a problem of aspiring to a particular role, uh, it's a problem of moving from that to actually being able to perform it. And performable roles is uh, what we're talking about in this 
uh, uh, context. Um, one of the influences on that is the external, as I would call it, the external opportunity structure. The fact that, you know, the external structure of the international arena, of the global system, may or may not allow the European Union uh, to play the kind of role it wishes to, or for that matter, the British. Um, those people who've written about uh, the idea of opportunity structures uh, have talked about them mainly in the start from the point of view of social movements. What is it that enables particular social movements to exert leverage at some times and not at others? Well, it's an idea which can be applied to international relations as well. Uh, and my broad conception of it is uh, that in, for example, the late 1990s, the global opportunity structure was one that enabled the European Union to exert considerable influence in particular areas. It was a kind of open structure which gave opportunities. Uh, since then, uh, it's arguable the, the global opportunity has structure has closed down, that the European Union has fewer opportunities to exert global influence, uh, and that you know, you can think of examples as we speak uh, uh, you know, of the way in which the European Union uh, may or may not be able to exercise influence. But things like the, uh, what people call the resurgence of geopolitics, uh, you know, the, the, the return to power politics or the politics of manoeuvre uh, in particular areas like the Middle East, obviously, uh, is something that the European Union uh, has not been well equipped to deal with. Uh, Geopolitics is not something the European Union is necessarily good at, uh, partly because of the way the European Union is composed and the way in which it makes decisions. So basic, basic issue then is uh, the problem of the European Union's role in world politics and linked to that the problem of the British role in world politics is one that we uh, should investigate. And I've be very briefly set out four elements that can be used to, to, to analyse this kind of uh, role. Role conceptions, in other words, how people think they should be operating in the global arena. Role design and institutionalisation, in other words, how they then design institutions or policies to try and pursue that role, and this is a good example. It's a very good example of role design for the EU. Um, uh, role performance, in other words, what actually happens, uh, and then role impact, in other words, the impact that this has, not only on the outside world, but on uh, the uh, European Union uh, in this case, in the European Union itself. It's a very important, obviously, to remember that none of this happens in isolation. If, you, if you're trying to play a particular role in world politics, it happens in a context. Uh, it happens not only in one context, it happens in a whole range of linked contexts. You know, trade is linked to security, is linked to environment, is linked to human rights, and so on. So in, engagement with world politics and world economics in, is, is, a, is a question of partly of linkage, of coordination, of how you, you know, try and play the same role or do you play the same role in different contexts. Um, and it's linked inexorably to the problem of communication and negotiation. Uh, the European Union, it often has been said, is a kind of negotiation machine. Uh, if it moves, negotiate with it, uh, is uh, said to be part of the European Union's makeup. Um, but actually, being a negotiation machine or a negotiation process uh, in yourself uh, doesn't necessarily equip you to deal with the challenges that come from the external context and the external uh, crises or conflicts within with which you might be confronted. Now, in this context, Brexit uh, is a very particular kind of challenge. Uh, it's a long-term challenge. It's a complex challenge. It targets and affects almost every arena you can think of in relations not only between Britain and the EU, but in between uh, the EU and the outside world. And it occurs in a global arena where there is unprecedented fluidity, 
there are processes of change and crisis that can be triggered by a tweet uh, and we've seen an example of that this week, uh, what somebody once called a crisis slide, which was triggered by somebody sending a tweet at 5 a.m. in the morning or whenever it was. Um, and uh, almost literally by that, uh, which is a, uh, or by the odd telephone call as well. Um, so uh, we're dealing with something which is going to, you know, people talk in the UK as if Brexit will be finished at the end of October. The end of October which year, you might well ask? Uh, um, maybe 10 years' time? Uh, the effects of it and the knock-on negotiations and the uh, arrangements that will need to be made if it occurs uh, are uh, going to last, if not for decades, at least for uh, many or several years. <coughs> Um, so this is the challenge of Brexit. It seems to be something that affects the EU and affects Britain in all sorts of different areas over a very long period and in an unpredictable global arena. And for the EU itself, what that means is, uh, well, what are we going to do? Are we going to be what some people would call path dependent? Are we simply just going to go on doing what we've already always done uh, because that's the way we do things? Or are we going to have to create new kinds of policies? Uh, are we going to have to innovate in policy uh, as a result of Brexit? Remember, uh, my argument is actually that the result of Brexit for European Union external action is not really, in many ways, at the end of the day, the key thing. It's the results of the broader forces within which Brexit occurs that are going to influence uh, European policy. Okay, uh, here we are, trade and development, first of our three areas. Um, this is very important to both Britain and the EU, as, you know, it, you know that's, 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 that's absolute truism, but it's important in particular ways because uh, what Linda Colley has called the cult of commerce, uh, the idea that the British have a unique role in uh, safeguarding commerce in the international arena, which you may say is a post-imperial idea uh, and was reinforced in the 18th and 19th centuries in British policy by the growth of empire, uh, is something that's absolutely fundamental to British foreign policy. It's not for nothing that the idea of global Britain entails commerce, trade and so on. Um, this in turn intersects with the fact that the European Union is what some people call a trading state. In other words, European Union external action is inexorably conditioned by the need for stability, the need for conditions in which commerce, uh, in its broadest sense, can flourish. And the European Union commitment to multilateralism, to rules in the international arena, is a reflection of the idea that the European Union is a trading state. Um, uh, what does Brexit do to this? Uh, well, for the British, uh, what it does, I would argue, is make them vastly more vulnerable uh, in the international arena uh, than they have been as members of the European Union. Um, uh, Britain after Brexit will be some kind of middle power, as Silke Trummer has called it, uh, in a changing global system where middle powers are in danger of being squeezed uh, by the major powers, of which one is the European Union, in this context, trade particularly. Uh, for the British, this means you've got to renegotiate your position in the World Trade Organization, and the European Union has to renegotiate its position in the World Trade Organization. Um, the only difficulty that comes up is that American policy seems to be designed by the end of this year to actually destroy the World Trade Organization. Uh, that the Americans have refused to allow appointments to the World Trade Organization's appellate body, uh, without which the World Trade Organization can't resolve disputes. Um, so there's, you know, you, you don't, it's an apocalyptic view, but it, it seems to be arguing that uh, uh, the United States wants to destroy the World Trade Organization and that's the way they're choosing to do it. Um, uh, so both Britain and the EU, EU have got to cope with the fact that actually uh, the, uh, uh, the World Trade System is under threat in a way that it hasn't been 
uh, for some time in the past. For Britain, uh, the lack of resources, the growth of its vulnerability, uh, the idea that you know global Britain is going to be a very open economy, uh, that in the first instance, if you leave with no deal, there'll be no tariffs on virtually any imports into the <coughs> UK. Uh, that's a, that is a escalation of vulnerability that's all, always been there in British uh, external trade policy. For the European Union, the question is, and it's been well expressed this past week in various ways, uh, is, is the Britain going to become a kind of uh, low wage, uh, low regulation, uh, low uh, uh, barriers to trade economy, which would then have a quite a significant effect on the EU's global market. And of course, that's what the or internal market. And that's what the whole argument about Ireland and various other things are part of what, what it stems from. Um, uh, is the UK going to be some kind of, uh, you know, low rent uh, competitor for the EU, kind of Singapore off the northwest of Europe? Uh, I think it's very difficult to see how that can happen. It's not to say that there aren't people in the Conservative Party in Britain who aren't thinking about it. Um, uh, and uh, it, from the point of view of Britain, actually that sort of position would multiply its vulnerability within the global economy because the British economy is not the same as the Singaporean economy uh, and doesn't have the resilience and the bounce back ability, as somebody once called it, uh, to actually cope with this issue. Uh, the danger for the British is actually, and the benefit for the EU in many ways, is that uh, it lies in a process of what people call regulatory capture. Uh, that uh, whatever the terms of British Brexit, in the end, uh, you'll have to negotiate something which makes the British very subject to EU regulatory policies. Uh, uh, whether you do it willingly or not, that's what's going to have to happen uh, because the EU accounts for some 40% of British trade. Uh, and there's no way even the most extreme of the so-called Spartans uh, in the Conservative Party would actually be able to justify uh, not conforming to European Union regulation in some way. Um, but this is in a broader trading environment. And I, my point, I think, is that the broader trading environment is, is, is what's going to really determine the EU's capacity to uh, uh, reinvent itself in trade or whether it needs to reinvent itself in trade. And the key element in the global environment for trade at the minute is the Trump element, uh, the weaponization of the American economy, uh, the use of trade as a, uh, an instrument of foreign policy uh, in, a, in a rather erratic way, the use of trade sanctions, of course, in a very widespread way, although that's a tradition in American policy which goes back quite a long way. Um, so the Trump challenge, uh, the idea of uh, trade wars as an instrument of policy, is something that's going to be more uh, 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 challenging and immediate for the European Union. And in that context, the, the dealing with Brexit is a very awkward and difficult problem, but it's not the key problem for the European Union. Uh, because inevitably, in the end, the British... Uh, this is my argument, are going to have to conform in some way or another to European regulatory structures uh, and trade policies. It may take 10 years, but that's what it's going to have to happen. So the, for the British, the new vulnerabilities, uh, new ser a search for new forms of integration, because the British economy cannot exist without integration with others in some sense, is taking place in uh, this arena of what Alberta Spragio and, and Chad Damro have called competitive interdependence. Like, there's lots of interdependence, but it's between rival blocks and rival uh, great powers, so to speak. I've already said this will lead to a continuing need for the link between the UK and the EU. But the question is, what kind of partnership is it going to be? Is it going to be a customs union? Well, some people in Britain still think that that's the likely outcome or a possible outcome. Could be a partial customs union, of course. Uh, could be a Japan-type uh, economic partnership agreement. And I've always thought, since last year when the EU concluded its agreement with Japan, 
uh, that actually that's the model that could work for a Britain that's detached from Europe. An economic partnership agreement, a strategic partnership agreement alongside it, and a structure that goes along with it of institution and institutions uh, to run it. Uh, the third type that people have obviously mentioned is some sort of European economic area type, and I sense that uh, uh, the idea that Britain should join the European economic area is not one that would be greeted with uh, universal enthusiasm by members of the European economic area. Um, but the point, about, the point about all this is that uh, all of this remains to be decided. None of this has actually been negotiated. There's a, there's a political declaration uh, for the British, uh, 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 alongside the British withdrawal agreement, uh, negotiated by Mrs May, uh, but none of it has actually been negotiated or even started to be negotiated. Uh, but my argument would be, uh, for the European Union, there's more likely to be kind of path dependency, go on as you are, but the challenges come from somewhere other than Brexit. Uh, trade and development, this is the development bit. Essentially in development, I'm going to be, uh, I won't take very much longer. <laughs> um, uh, in development, my argument would be that the current system of development assistance, including EU development assistance, but also national development assistance policies, uh, is actually likely to be maintained, uh, not without change, uh, but uh, without fundamental change, because it's a very mixed system already. Uh, the British are part of the European Union's development policies, but they've also got their national development policies. And in a way, there's a change of emphasis if Britain leaves the European Union, but I think that on the ground in particular, where there have been uh, evolving ways of operating between EU, national, non-EU, non-member state policies uh, over a long period of time, there's relatively little change that might be anticipated. The real change that might be anticipated from Brexit is if the uh, extreme Brexiteers, who also are extreme Conservatives in many ways, uh, have a lot of influence, which would lead to a significant reduction in UK aid budgets. Because uh, they've got two targets beyond leaving the EU. Uh, one is reducing uh, the development assistance budget, and the other, uh, which in some ways is even more uh, worrying uh, than leaving the EU, sorry, my, my personal preferences are probably intruding at this point, um, is to uh, uh, withdraw Britain from the European Convention on Human Rights uh, on the grounds that we can do something much better by ourselves. Uh, uh, but you know, we maybe talk about that in discussion. But, um, uh, I think there's only going to be a, m a moderate change here. That doesn't mean the British haven't got an influence because they've been very influential on U EU aid policy over the years. Uh, the Lomé conventions then transmogrified into the Cotonou conventions and so on, uh, uh, which, which frame European Union development policy were initiated because of Britain joining the EU and have developed from that point. Um, so uh, one of the changes that is going to be there is the withdrawal of Britain from some of these multilateral development partnerships, at least in formal terms. Uh, for the British uh, and for other member state states, the EU has provided collectivization of obligations, what some people call political economies of scale. In other words, you can hide behind the other members or you can spread the risk. Uh, uh, for the British, it's had a, you know, effects on their leadership. They've been leaders in U European Union aid policy, uh, but they've also maintained their independence. Uh, so they've been a, dyna a dynamic but not always a positive partner for the EU in development policy, and that's the way it will probably continue. Um, the, the Brexit process is going to be disruptive. Uh, it's going to be, uh, it's going to change some of the relationships because of course uh, the members of the economic partnership agreements that have emerged from the Cotonou conventions are very largely in many cases ex-British colonies and members of the British or the 
the Commonwealth. Uh, so there are going to be things that need to be worked out there, and there are things that will worry and do worry uh, Commonwealth uh, developing countries. Uh, but it's not just because of Brexit, it's because of the broader development of British development policy and the broader securitization and politicization of development policies in general. There are external challenges that intersect with this, for example, the challenge from China uh, and the different kind of development assistance and aid policies that the Chinese operate. My view would be, though, that the European Union's development policy is going to exhibit considerable path dependency. It's going to carry on in much the same way. Uh, changes in it are unlikely to be purely because of Brexit and, and they're not unlikely to reflect purely the withdrawal of the British, uh, long as that may withdrawal may take. Third thing, transatlantic relations. We've talked about this already. In many ways, you can't avoid it when you're talking about uh, 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 Britain and the EU. Uh, and the lure of special relationships is something that it's not just the British that think they have a special relationship with the Americans. It's the British, perhaps, that think it more persistently, and I was going to say more deludedly, <laughs> um, than, uh, than anybody else. Uh, but Clearly, if you look around the European Union, almost every member state thinks it's got a special relationship with the US. Maybe their version of the US doesn't always correspond with what's actually happening in the US, um, but uh, it's something that is inescapable. And the question is, uh, if Britain withdraws from the EU, uh, what difference does that make to this kind of arrangement? Because the special relationship has been a source of disruption in Britain's membership of the European Union at various times. Uh, you think back to Iraq uh, and so on. Um, uh, how much of a basis or a need is there for new arrangements uh, in this case? And how much of that is because of Brexit? Well, of course, a lot of it is not due to Brexit at all unless you assume that Donald Trump and Brexit are so inexorably linked that one would not have existed without the other. Um, uh, <coughs> the, you know, Donald Trump isn't the first US president to be unilateralist uh, or to see the Europeans as foes. Uh, Richard Nixon in 1971 pronounced what was called the Nixon shock, which effectively in the end killed off the Bretton Woods system, uh, fixed currency rates and so on. And his Secretary of the Treasury, John Connolly from Texas, uh, was quoted immortally as saying the purpose of our policy is, and I apologize for the language, to screw the Europeans before they screw us, right? Uh, so it's, you know, Donald Trump is drawing on a rich tradition, uh, but, but he is the first uh, person to have unequivocally designated the European Union as a, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, not just an adversarial partner, uh, but uh, uh, an enemy that uh, should, if possible, and there are people in the US who actually do want this, uh, be destroyed. Um, for the European Union, of course, what this means is that it challenges their ability to actually establish and perform a consistent and stable role. Uh, because uh, and in common with lots and lots of other political entities in the world, they're having to, to react to an American policy which is essentially unpredictable, disruptive, and of course that's, you know, uh, there are people in the US who say that's precisely the point. We're disrupting uh, the established order uh, without, of course, any idea of what order might follow it uh, and uh, what might replace it. Um, so, uh, as we've seen, we've seen over the past week uh, the uh, problem that confronts the European Union in establishing a consistent role and a consistent position in uh, the face of American uh, unpredictability and disruptiveness uh, aimed at not only individual conflicts and individual targets, uh, but arguably at the whole of the multilateral system, the so-called liberal world order uh, itself. Uh, for the UK, 
uh, this only emphasizes their vulnerability. Anybody who thinks in the UK, and there are people who think this, that they're going to get an even-handed trade agreement out of the Trump administration, the special privilege for, for the British is unfortunately deluding themselves. Um, uh, their vulnerability is emphasized by this. It will be underlined by it. Uh, especially if the Trump administration gets a second term next year. Um, they're dependent on the USA politically and economically. Uh, they are going to find themselves outside the political economies of scale produced by the European Union. Uh, and uh, the implications for the European Union uh, are in a sense, the implications that follow from having an economically troubled outsider, but not really yet an outsider, on their northwestern border. Uh, and it's not uh, a politically troubled small country, it's a politically troubled and economically troubled uh, large country uh, that has been central, for example, to the European Union single market. Uh, the implications, well, I've, I've said something about this already, but the implications could be uh, that you have a Britain uh, which is essentially, uh, as some people want, allied to the United States, come hell or high water, uh, and that that will have disruptive effects for European Union external policies in general, as well as trade uh, and uh, defence, as we'll see in just a second. Um, this could lead to benefits for the EU, and of course there are people who argue this, that not having uh, Britain in the EU uh, will help to solidify, and Penilla mentioned this at the, at the beginning, help to solidify some of the ways in which the European unions can fend for themselves. In other words, in terms of the global strategy, strategic autonomy would be assisted by the departure of the European, of the, of the United Kingdom, sorry. Um, but the trouble is this goes along with some costs. Uh, it goes along with a challenge to the entire system of global governance, not just the World Trade Organization, but the International Court of Justice and various other semi-legal or legal mechanisms that have been fundamental to the stability of the European uh, Union. Uh, it goes along with a rise in what people call transactional diplomacy. In other words, not uh, not a general feeling that you need to cooperate for the good of everybody, but, you know, you give me this, I may give you that. Much more specific, much more challenging, much more demanding diplomacy. Um, for the European Union, that's difficult, because one of the characteristics of European Union diplomacy has been what you might call its deliberative nature. In other words, they like to talk about it for quite a long time before they undertake. They don't tweet in quite the same way as Donald Trump, and they can't. They can't, because that's not the nature of the European Union. So here again, we're faced with that issue, which is unanswerable at the minute, about what the new relationship between the European Union and the United Kingdom might be. Um, is it going to be some kind of new strategic partnership? Whatever it is, it's going to have to cope with the idea that they've got disruption from outside from the Americans. Uh, and don't get the impression that all of the American disruption would disappear overnight if Donald Trump was defeated next November. I may wish for that. <laughs> Other people may wish for that, but uh, it wouldn't disappear the problem. Finally, and I'm, I'm using up too much of my time, uh, Security and defence policy. I'm sorry about the headline is a bit too big. I don't know how you realised that after I said it, sent it. Um, a lot of what I've said already plays into this. It's obviously, it's clear, you know, for when the British have been members of the European Union, they've been on one hand essential to the development of a European foreign and security policy and a defence policy, but on the other hand they've been obstructive the awkward partner problem again. So centrality to EU policies is part of the British membership. Uh, but again, as Pernilla said earlier on, uh, leaving or Britain leaving the EU may allow developments in policy areas that have hitherto been off limits because of the British uh, obstruction. Nonetheless, you do have a partner here, security partner, 
uh, which is, if not uniquely qualified uh, in European Union terms, is extremely well qualified, not just in terms of traditional security, but also in terms of the new dimensions of security, like cyber security and so on. Um, uh, here you have a member state uh, which is a member of the so-called Five Eyes, the intelligence arrangements on a global level, uh, the US, Britain, Canada, Australia and New Zealand, uh, that uh, provides uh, intelligence, not necessarily shared with the EU, I have to say, but provides it uh, on a global level. Um, so you've got the same problem as we've had before. Is the departure of Britain going to subtract something? Well, undoubtedly in security and defence it would. Uh, is that going to make it possible uh, for the European Union to enter new areas and to produce new institutional forms and so on? Answer, yes. Will those new institutional forms actually lead to a transformation of European security and defence policy? Uncertain, because it is possible to establish the institutions and that to be the end of it. You know, it doesn't necessarily have an effect on policy. Uh, now, you know, that's dismissing it in a, in a way that might be too severe. But, but you can see the problem. If Britain leaving liberates the EU in security and defence policy, will the EU then be able to establish, going back to my former point, f performable roles in defence and security? In other words, roles for which they have the capacity, the political will uh, to actually... Uh, implement them to turn them into operational policy. Of course, that depends on how much you think the, Amer the British contributed uh, and how they contributed and how that balances out against the fact that they were disruptive, obstructive, and so on. Uh, but it, you know, I suppose one, one small example of how this might work is, of course, if Britain withdraws, then the and it has happened already. I think the uh, operational headquarters for Operation Atalanta off the uh, uh, African coast uh, leaves Britain and becomes a European venture. It was based in Northwood near Watford. Um, uh, and becomes a, Brit uh, a European venture. That may create some problems, but it actually also, of course, creates a leap forward in some ways in European defence cooperation. Uh, so this is a very difficult one to decide. Uh, you're losing uh, a member state that has specific, distinctive, if not unique, advantages and brings them to the table, but doesn't always share them. Uh, you're being liberated from that member state, and that may actually enable you to produce new areas of policy initiative, creativity. Uh, the question is whether that then moves on in the circumstances of the international arena as we know it into performable policy, operational policy that in some sense works. Uh, so uh, there are possible new relationships with the British and of course this is an area in which both the British and the European Union uh, should want to establish these new relationships as a matter of urgency. Um, uh, uh, Martel, Martel and Seuss in the recent study uh, talked about three or four alternatives. CSDP plus, Common Security and Defence Policy plus, where Britain is very closely associated, uh, which may or may not be feasible. A new close relationship with NATO, because nobody will be keener on NATO than Britain, uh, for obvious reasons, uh, in a post-Brexit situation. Uh, but what does NATO mean in the context of Trump and the American challenge? Uh, a series of bilateral agreements like those between Britain and France uh, that already exists, uh, which would take many, if not several, years to, uh, uh, to uh, negotiate. And some people would say, well, what will happen is some sort of just ad hoc problem solving. You know, people have got used to working together uh, in the context of the European Union, and therefore they will continue to work together uh, almost whatever the uh, uh, general political situation. Uh, and this will lead to uh, policy learning and problem solving at, on the ground in particular, in particular areas. 
again, you come up to this point. Is the UK effect, the Brexit effect, and I've overrun, uh, sorry about that, is the Brexit effect separable from these broader forces, uh, the Trump effect, the changing nature of the international arena. We haven't really talked about the power shifts in the international arena that have taken place and various other areas. Uh, now, I'm, this is just a summary, really. Uh, for the EU, there are certain political and other effects. For the UK, I think those effects are much more uh, severe. Uh, uh, I wouldn't say they are existential, although actually some people have said the existence of the UK will be challenged by the uh, effects of Brexit. Um, the UK as we know it. Uh, there will be new opportunities because of the changing nature of the international arena, but also new risks for the European <laughs> Union. And there will be implications for third party perceptions of the European Union. Is it some way diminished by the absence of Britain or is it some, in some way enhanced? So for the European Union, uh, and it really doesn't mark a huge change, uh, the European Union's role conceptions may fragment. It may lead to challenges to the overall conception of the European Union's international role. It will lead to or will be accompanied by patchy role performance, but that's nothing to do with Brexit, really. That's been the, the European Union's problem all the way along. It has led, and I'm sorry that I left this out of that list, has led to significant additional role institutionalization and role design, or it's been accompanied by it. And nobody could deny when they were talking about the whole of the European global strategy pre-1916, that it was partly framed uh, in the likelihood of some kind of British Brexit. And it has been since. So both for Britain and for the EU, there are problems of converting discourse into action. Uh, the European Union has the problem of converting the global strategy, uh, which is influenced by Brexit, but not caused necessarily by Brexit, uh, into operational policy. Britain, I think, has a much more severe problem, which is actually trying to reinvent itself uh, without the uh, added capabilities that arise from the European Union, and in a world where its vulnerability will be underlined, not only by the policies of adversaries, but by the policies of those that have hitherto been considered their most fundamental allies. Um, and so both Britain and the EU have a problem here. I think the problem for the EU is in the process, in many ways, of being resolved insofar as it can be. The problem for Britain is going to be much more difficult and much more fundamental over the next five to ten years. And I don't say that with any relish at all. And that's what I want to say. Yeah. <laughs> okay. oh, yeah, I'll bring that. The chair is here. Uh, thank you so much for a very interesting introduction. I will now open the floor for, for questions and comments. Uh, I will start with a few, few questions myself. Uh, and while I, I pose the questions, you can sign, sign up. Um, Talking to, to uh, EU diplomats, I think that uh, uh, and EU diplomats here in Oslo also uh, saying that uh, why, why all this fuss about Brexit? Why do you have all these seminars on Brexit? Because it's actually not so important. <laughs> we should focus on other things. Yeah. Um, and that uh, turns back to, to a little bit what you said, that actually it's, it's a greater problem probably for, uh, it's a problem for the EU, but it's a, a great problem for, for the UK how to adapt. Uh, but I want to go back to, to what you said about um, uh, about kind of the, the geopolitical context and now that we move into a phase of power politics and how the EU um, can act on that or if it's able to act on that. Um, because one thing is to say that it's not set up for that uh, kind of game. But is it also possible to say that because of the EU's difference, it can be a force of protecting multilateralism um, 
precisely because it's not uh, kind of playing into that power game in the same way. Um, and it also goes to, to the development that we see of more and more, especially in security and defense and also in other policy areas, uh, more differentiated integration. Uh, and we see that, that the EU is getting more pragmatic in a sense. It's not, it's not so easy to say that the EU is this kind of normative power that is used to, uh, or it used to present itself as it, and it had also been analyzed, been analyzed as a normative power. But it's more strategic, and it's using different instruments. It also, um, when when I refer to differentiated integration, I don't mean only within the EU, but also that you have some horizontal differentiated integration that I mentioned in the beginning, that you have different con kind of cooperation structures, some uh, between member states in the EU, but also that includes uh, kind of uh, the UK after Brexit, uh, potentially in close cooperation in many of the areas that you are talking about. Yeah. So I wonder if that is a, is a way of, of seeing it. Well, I, no, I think you're, you're right. Um, uh, I, I think your very first statement, and, or your first implication that the EU really isn't set up to do geopolitics. Uh, and by implication shouldn't be, uh, is an interesting one. I mean, where the EU has become involved in geopolitics, it has not always distinguished itself. Uh, I suppose the most obvious example is the Ukraine, uh, where uh, the pursuit of a particular line of European Union diplomacy uh, was eventually just simply absolutely cut off by the fact that uh, geopolitics, the use of force, and, and so on, became uh, the predominant language, so to speak, of the, of the, of the dispute. Um, and other areas in the Middle East, there are, there are points at which the, uh, the European Union, in effect, ceases to have, a more, th have more than a voice. It has a voice, but it doesn't necessarily have the uh, uh, ability to uh, uh, operate influence uh, events on the ground if the language of force, the language of geopolitics becomes dominant. Now, there are some people, of course, who say that, well, it, it should have. It should have. Uh, and the European Union should consider itself as a power, uh, as you know, part of a kind of Go back to Richard Nixon again. <coughs> he and Kissinger used to talk about a pentapolar world uh, in which you had the United States, you had Russia, the Soviet Union at the time, of course, you had China, uh, you had Europe, uh, and uh, uh, what was the other pole? Uh, it was India, wasn't it? Uh, um, um, in, in which you had five great centers of power and they effectively ran the world between them, like, a bit like the concert of Europe back in the 19th century. Um, uh, and there are some people who actually do argue that the European Union should equip itself to engage in that kind of operation, uh, in that kind of uh, high-level diplomatic maneuvering uh, and, and so on. Um, uh, I think that what what you said in the rest of the, your your question was was exactly right. That although in, in this talk you can't, I couldn't talk about it in huge detail. What you have had, and you don't just have to believe what the European Union says about itself, um, uh, which is putting the best gloss on it. But what you have had is a period of creativity and in innovation in European Union. Uh, security and defense policy, for example, uh, which has uh, led to significant developments. Uh, significant developments at the level of resources uh, available, uh, significant developments at the level of uh, uh, institutional efficiency, as you might call it. Um, uh, other areas, uh, such as development policy, the European Union has aligned itself ever more closely with United Nations. And in a way, the commitment to multilateralism uh, uh, is seen by at least some people in, in EU circles as you know, saving the United Nations in a way, that it's the European Union that has the ability to, uh, to do this, where others might have the ability, but they certainly don't have the willingness to do it. Um, uh, and, and you're right that within the European Union, I think you, you have got, well, you've already had a process of, uh, of differentiated in integration. Uh, 
and relations with third parties uh, outside the European Union that is bound, almost bound to be, uh, assuming Brexit, it's bound to be one of the characteristics of the uh, European Union's relationship with, uh, with Britain, particularly in security and defence policy. Uh, and arguably, as I said, you can, you can foresee this n not just happening, but in a way continuing in development policy. Um, uh, uh, trade policy, of course, is going to be subject to uh, a, an extended negotiation of uh, what some people once said was going to be the easiest free trade agreement ever to negotiate. Well, I don't think it's going to turn out that way, I'm afraid. Um, uh, so allocate several years to that. Uh, of course, you could come to a framework agreement which was then provisionally implemented and provisionally operated uh, because possibly it's in everybody's interest to do so. Um, uh, so there are new instruments, there are new cooperative structures, uh, and these don't just exist in security and defence policy, although that's been one of the most obvious areas where they have uh, developed. Uh, uh, in development policy, there's been the whole development of things like trust funds and so on, which is uh, uh, a, a European Union initiative. So, you know, uh, I think it's it's easy to be a bit pessimistic, as many people are, about the continuation of the European Union, but it's also easy to see that there are seeds of new creativity that have developed and have sprouted uh, over the last few years. Not just because of Brexit, though. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, I think that's the bottom line of everything. <laughs> okay, I have two, um, two questions. One over here and then here. Were there anybody else? Yeah, just sign up uh, if you want to say something. Do you have a microphone there? I could hear. Uh, you hear me now? I could hear you before. Uh, <laughs> I I will try to present a piece of advice uh, to the European Union, if it wants to be a force for the good. I think that's a fantastic idea, if that is possible. And um, uh, my advice would be to help developing countries get control of their own economic zones and uh, help uh, developing countries to fish their own fish in their own fishing areas. That would be quite another role uh, in contrast to the EU's role now and traditionally where they uh, make deals with uh, third world countries uh, to get access for uh, the EU fishing fleet in their economic zones all over the world. Uh, that's the opposite of being good. That is being bad. And, and uh, I think also this uh, ha can be linked to the Bre uh, Brexit process because Many fi uh, fishy, uh, uh, fishing nations in the EU, they will regret uh, that they are losing their power in the British zone. It was a uh, big argument in the Brexit discussion that uh, the UK should uh, regain control of its own fishing zone. And uh, if the EU fleet now loses even the British economic zone control, Will this strengthen uh, the European uh, drive to fish in a development uh, countries' fishing zones? Right, okay. Okay, you can take that. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I agree entirely with you that the, uh, you have to distinguish between the EU's self-image and how others experience it. Uh, in uh, in the past, I've done quite a lot of work in Thailand, for example, and the way in which the Thai chicken and shrimp industries were subjected to EU policies that seemed to come out of nowhere and s had a very dramatic effect. And, and the whole issue of EU access, uh, EU member states' access to uh, fishing grounds is, is one that has the same sort of uh, uh, tone to it. Um, so the... The idea that the EU is a force for good, but actually in any particular set of circumstances or policy area, it's not. 
Um, and it acts in a way just like any other uh, international actor uh, in, in line with the conception of uh, European interests and how they might uh, be pursued uh, is perfectly, you know, it's a perfectly legitimate one and it's perfectly, uh, as, I, uh, as, as framed by you, it's a perfectly reasonable uh, request to make. On the, on, on the UK one, I mean, uh, I think you're right that if they did lose access to the British gra fishing grounds, there might be more pressure to expand uh, their presence in others. Um, the question I ask is ex exactly, and I'm not an expert on fishing, but the idea that the British Brexiteers had that you would instantly regain access to all of your fishing grounds and that that would be an unalloyed good thing uh, doesn't seem to me to hold water. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, that uh, because the, fi the UK fishing industry uh, exports a very high percentage of its uh, fish and seafood to the European Union. So, you know, how do the the calculus work out between access to fishing grounds, and remember that's not just access by Europeans to the British fishing grounds, but access by the British to European fishing grounds, which has led to some disputes in the past. Um, uh, how does that balance off against the interests of the British fishing industry uh, in a broader sense? And, you know, uh, I think 10 years might be too little to negotiate that one. Uh, because what's going to have to happen if, if you know, and I don't think, I really don't think it's likely if uh, Britain, quotes, leaves the EU on the 31st of October, uh, uh, that's really the starting gun for a whole set of negotiations. You're going to have to have over the next decade, uh, you know, Norway knows something about this kind of thing, so do the Swiss, uh, you know, uh, which uh, is going to occupy a great deal of diplomatic time. Uh, it's going to be disruptive to everyone, but I think probably particularly to the British, and uh, it's going to uh, uh, produce results only at a very, very long uh, delay. Sorry, yes, the other question. Yeah, another question here, and then a bit more that I haven't seen. My name is Tone Rand. Thank you very much for a most interesting presentation. Uh, you mentioned Britain's role in uh, security and defense policy. I would kindly ask you to go a bit more into detail. Uh, based on your long and very solid um, experience, what is your perception of the possible development of the relationship between the EU and NATO? And then a second question. Uh, is there a realistic possibility for a second referendum? Thank you. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a s sting in the tail. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, on the second one, my cards are fully on the table. Uh, I'm a hundred percent Remainer, uh, as are ninety-five percent of British academics. Uh, um, uh, but uh, you know, I have, I have several positions. One is 100% remain. Second is, if you're going to negotiate Brexit, do it properly, right? Which is what they didn't do and haven't done. Uh, some fundamental errors of negotiation were made by the Theresa May administration, uh, not least of which was not reaching out and establishing ownership of the negotiations across parties in Britain to start with. Um, so, uh, on, the, on the issue of a second referendum, of course, with a second referendum, I, w I would be all in favour of a second referendum, but I wouldn't necessarily think it would be won by Remain, um, especially not if it was fought like the first referendum. Uh, uh, there's a question of timing, and the question of timing is whether you have it before or after a general election. The... Um, uh, European Union has always said it will grant an extension to the negotiations in the event of a major democratic event, which would either be a referendum or a general election, or it might be both, I suppose. Um, uh, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm, I think the idea of a confirmatory referendum is a very good thing, if you only knew what it was you were trying to confirm. 
in the way of a withdrawal agreement. Uh, uh, and if you have a confirmatory referendum on the withdrawal agreement, you also have one on the political declaration as a statement of uh, uh, political objectives. Um, uh, I would all be in favour of all of those things. Uh, I think that uh, uh, the Labour Party's position, uh, I'm afraid, as a long-standing member of the Labour Party, has been extremely disappointing in terms of their ability to establish a position. The position they've got at the minute is very logical, but is it politically explainable and, and uh, sellable? Um, so... Uh, uh, yes, I would, I would think that there's a possibility of a second referendum. I think it's more likely to take place after uh, a general election than before one. And you've got to assume that the general election actually produces a clear result, which I don't think it would, <laughs> I'm afraid. Um, uh, the only possibility is, of course, that uh, our Prime Minister who's not known for his consistency on these things, might suddenly have a conversion to the idea of a second referendum um, out of desperation or whatever, and that uh, that would uh, uh, lead to a, a second referendum taking place before a, uh, a general election. But of course, the problem for both Theresa May and Boris Johnson uh, has been actually controlling their own party uh, as well as controlling the overall political process. So I'm not sure that they would actually be able to put that into operation, even if it was the subject of a last-minute conversion. Um, on the UK's role in security and defence and the possible development between the EUs and NATO, Penila knows 2,000% <laughs> more about this than I do. Um, uh, uh, I mean, there's already been a significant development in the the relationship between the EU and NATO. The problem is, which NATO are you talking about? Are you talking about the NATO that would reflect Donald Trump's uh, version of events? Uh, or are you talking about some sort of NATO that's become much more, in a way, Europeanized as a result of the Trump challenge? Um, uh, if that second thing were the case, then it would be much in principle, it would be much easier for the EU uh, to develop a, uh, uh, a strong relationship, a stronger relationship. It's already quite strong, although there are some things that people thought were going to be strong which haven't turned out to be uh, uh, as effective. Um, uh, <sighs> One thing is for sure, as I said in, in my talk, Nobody will be keener on NATO than the British because it's their foothold in European security and defence. And uh, the issue then becomes, does the British status in NATO change if uh, they are no longer members of the European Union? Do they become less able to exert their leverage or, s or maintain their position in terms of the actual positions within NATO uh, as a, uh, uh, a non-member of the European Union. Uh, and I don't think anybody knows the answer to that. Uh, but um, I, w I would say it's more likely in many ways that there will be a stronger relationship with NATO, but the question with NATO is how much are the Americans going to remain committed to NATO? Thank you. My name is Odgunnar Skagestad, and um, I'd like to return to the issue of fisheries and the European Union. I have more than 30 years of experience in negotiating fisheries issues with the Euro European Union, or the European communities, as we used to call it in the old days. Uh, experience both in bi on the bilateral level, as uh, with the European Union as our adversaries on the other side of the table, also in regional context, in within several regional fisheries management organizations where we have partly had the EU as a rival organization or a, a, an adversary, and also in the United Nations context, uh, in the global uh, context. So uh, I would just like to say that uh, 
uh, if you look at the question of whether the EU is a f force for good or bad, I think that's a bit too crude basis to, uh, to make any useful or meaningful analysis on the role of the EU. They can be quite tough as negotiating parties, but during the past, let's say, since the 70s, when the negotiations that ended with the 1982 Law of the uh, Sea Convention were negotiated, that's more than 40 years, they have been basically, by and large, a constructive force in, in uh, developing the international regime for management of uh, ocean and marine res living resources. Uh, finally, I'd like to agree with you in your um, belief that it would take more than 10 years to sort out all the, the uh, well, all the issues that need to be negotiated in connection with fisheries if and when uh, the UK leaves the EU. And that goes not only for the bilateral relations between UK and EU, but even more so the um, bilateral relations between Norway and the UK okay, on the other hand, and on one hand, and the relations between Norway and the EU on the other hand. And then I hadn't even started to discuss the possible implications of uh, the UK, sp UK splitting up in England and Scotland. Uh -huh. So we we'll leave that <laughs> matter. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, I think we need to, because we're running yeah. a bit out of time. We had two more questions, so I think we take those as yep. well, and then yep, you can... Uh, yeah, yeah. So Maria on the first, seconds. and then over here. Okay, thank you, Marianne Rydvall from uh, Høgskolen i Innlandet and NUPI. Thank you for a really fantastic talk uh, that I very much enjoyed. I um, very much agree with you that Brit no, Brexit might not be that important to the EU's global role, that it's these stru changing structural factors and the Trump effect that might mean th uh, more for the EU's uh, global role. But I was also wondering if Brexit may affect the EU's ability to uh, be an effective multilateralist. Because the, the UK, after all, uh, uh, is very committed and very good at being a multilateralist. And in the EU's kind of internal coordination in multilateral organizations, the UK has played really a really a key role. It's very well prepared. It has the experts. It has the language. Uh, so, so one might... Uh, expect that actually without the EU, now the UK in the EU's kind of internal group in multilateral organizations, the EU might be less, effect less of an effective multilateralist. Or if one might expect the EU just to continue cooperating with the UK so it doesn't really change anything, as you said, based on that more like the socialization literature. And I was also wondering if we could um, uh, also just elaborate a bit more about what you think of the future relationship in the CFSP because the UK, there was some speculation that the UK would use its kind of military might and capability as a negotiation card in the Brexit negotiations, but it doesn't seem to have played that role, but the EU needs the UK on the ground and if Trump puts less uh, focus on NATO, I guess the UK will need the EU as well. So, Okay, thank you. Okay, so then we have a last question over here, and then you have <laughs> just a few minutes. To <laughs> we can maybe go a few minutes over over time. But I'm going to I'm going to try to be fast. Uh, first, it's about the uh, popularity and uh, legitimacy of the European Union in different European countries. Uh, since uh, uh, the establishment of the European Union, the number of people that has been voted in the European elections, except for the last one, has been sinking. And in some countries, it's been tragically low. And it's been consequently always been fewer people that's been voting in the EU elections than in the national parliamentary elections. So I'm wondering if uh, the rising awareness of the uh, unpopularity, as you can call it, of the EU has been more based upon a fear that uh, an awareness that if our country or that the, the, those countries are planning on leaving the EU, that they're going to have the same treatment as uh, the UK has received. And uh, one more thing, uh, the Labour Party. Uh, the Labour Party has tied itself up to being a pro-Remainer party. But the majority of the people that has been voted for uh, Labour uh, voted uh, for Brexit. Uh, 
And uh, could that has opened up that gap between the opinions of the leadership of the Labour Party and their voter, so that uh, that has opened up for uh, a breeding ground for the Brexit Party? Okay. Uh, right. Okay, can I deal with the last of those first? Um, actually, in the 19, uh, 2017 elections, I'm, um, in the 2017 elections, uh, uh, I think I'm right in saying that something like 60% uh, of Labour's votes came from Remainers, uh, not from... Uh, uh, but it's a question of where those votes are. And a lot of northern seats uh, in the UK uh, held by Labour uh, were heavily Remain. Uh, uh, rev sorry, heavily leave, sorry. Um, um, uh, so it's a bit of a paradox in terms of Labour Party support that you've got, you know, the, the, the Remain vote was concentrated in the South and uh, in the middle classes, so to speak, and uh, uh, that's an area where Labour has traditionally not been as strong. Uh, where it has traditionally been strong was heavily leave. Um, and this has caused a sort of internal paranoia in the Labour Party about exactly how you position yourself so that you don't lose those seats in a general election. Um, in a way, the Labour Party's uh, hopes rest with the Brexit Party, uh, the Nigel Farage's party, that, that they split the Leave vote with the Conservatives and that... Uh, 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 that uh, in some of those constituencies the, that would enable the Labour Party to, to hold on. But what it has done is uh, 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 changed uh, the internal Labour Party calculus. And the problem at the minute is that the, uh, the leadership and all of the sort of close advisors of the Labour Party come from uh, around London, uh, and are part of the sort of London Labour Party establishment, and that doesn't help them when it comes to trying to deal with problems in North of England and Scotland, particularly. Goes back to your point. Um, uh, uh, I, know I, have a, I have a strategy. One of my daughters lives in Orkney, and my strategy is I might go and join her. <laughs> 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 um, uh, 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 on the grounds that, uh, you know, Orkney actually wants its independence from Scotland, not just from Britain. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, the, the, there are so many things these days that you can't actually take uh, for granted, that you might have taken for granted before. You can't take for granted the uh, integrity, if that's what it is, of the, uh, uh, of the uh, United Kingdom. Uh, you can't take for granted... Uh, the capacity of the Labour Party to uh, win elections on the basis of its uh, North of England strategy and its strategy in uh, large urban areas where either you've got leave constituencies or you've got remain constituencies that just don't believe the Labour Party uh, because Jeremy Corbyn, I think everybody knows, is a, is a leaver on the grounds and, and part of a lot of his uh, close advisers uh, uh, and this is putting it very crudely, uh, people who think that if you leave the European Union that's an easier way to establish socialism in one country. Um, uh, you know, uh, you know I th I, there, are, there are so many things you can't actually uh, base your calculations on. Political opinion in the United Kingdom is so much more uh, volatile than it has been in the past. Um, uh, a lot, obviously, if you had a second referendum, the uh, voting public would have changed. Uh, you could put this very crudely in terms of people falling off the register at one end uh, and people coming onto the register at the other end uh, who, are, who are thought to be largely remain. Um, um, uh, the legitimacy of... of, of uh, the British political system is at issue. Now then, we, when you extend that onto an EU level, uh, you get the whole issue about illiberal democracy and the way in which uh, legitimacy for the European Union in a number of EU member states has declined. 
uh, quite apart from the uh, uh, <coughs> questionable support for the European Parliament elections. Uh, and in a way, the uh, increased turnout in the European Parliament elections is actually a symbol of the polarisation and the difficulty that has taken uh, uh, place across the European Union. It's not necessarily a good thing to have a higher turnout in terms of the uh, the way in which that turnout is structured. Um, uh, you know, much greater political brains than mine have found this difficult to deal with, and I find this as a, you know, it's a, it's, it's just a very uh, substantial area of uncertainty in member states and at the EU level. Uh, I think the EU level has actually come together better in many ways than people uh, uh, might have feared over the last few years, after post-crisis, so to speak. Um, and that's true of the foreign policy area, but it's true at a certain level, uh, at the level of uh, uh, institutional structures, the narrative that's been constructed, resources available, doesn't necessarily always ensure uh, success at the operational level. Um, uh, on, on Marianne's point, um, uh, the EU ability to achieve effective multilateralism because of the loss of the UK, of course they haven't lost all of the UK diplomats, quite a number of them now have Belgian passports. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, 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 I think that uh, you might find that a certain Britishness is injected into or remains in the European Union structures. Um, uh, the, the problem with British diplomacy was always it was a, it was a Rolls-Royce diplomatic machine, but the objectives to which it was directed were not necessarily ones that helped the European Union. Uh, uh, of course, they always had a very, very comprehensive explanations of why you shouldn't do something. Um, whereas within the UK, paradoxically, uh, the efficiency of the UK's administrative machine meant that European Union... Uh, directives and regulations were implemented in ways that would never have been uh, uh, undertaken in uh, other European Union member states, and that, in fact, uh, you know, uh, increased res resentment against the European Union. Um, so uh, another paradox: um, uh, the UK's role. I, I, I think it's in, it's possible to argue that actually getting the UK to participate in some EU operations is going to be easier when they're, if they're not members. Uh, because when they were members, or as they are members, uh, uh, participating in uh, certain operations was seen as some sort of legitimization of EU ex task expansion in foreign policy, which might not be seen in the same way uh, when you're an outsider. Uh, so. Uh, <laughs> it's another area of uncertainty, <laughs> but it's not necessarily all negative. Okay, I think we have to end there. Thank you so much for all your questions and comments. Thank you for a very good presentation. Uh, so, we have. I would. I will just uh, end by uh, by saying that we have uh, another seminar coming up at the end of the month with uh, Professor Andrew Muravchik, uh, who will come here from Princeton, talking about um, uh, wha and title of the of the uh, of his speech is why European uh, populist foreign policies are doomed to fail. So uh, that could be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs>